Okay, good morning. Um, welcome back to Operating Systems on a Friday morning. Um, it seems like the whole, uh, this building is kind of quieter on Fridays. So, one of the questions was, you know, if you try to do the homework project, you need to be super user to install kernels or, or change stuff, right? So all of you should have sudo access. So basically, if you do sudo any command, right, including a shell, right, it'll ask for your password, which is your FS password, you should be able to get root access. Um, as a root, you are privileged user, so you can do a whole bunch of damage to the system. So I hope that um, people are careful in not being malicious, right? Um, but if you really want, want the real root password so you can log in as root or something, let me know. Um, I have no problem giving it to you. Um, so does that help? Right. So hopefully people have started you know, working on the projects and stuff. How many of you haven't started yet? Okay, that's not a good sign, right? So um, I'm hoping that people would start working on it over the weekend or something. Um, especially you notice that if most of you are trying to wait till the last <coughs> moment, right? There's a finite number of resources up there, so um, we can't create a virtual clone of those machines, so you know, work, work with that restriction, right? So. Are there any questions about what we've covered so far? We're, so far, we looked at the processes and we're looking at, at threads. Um, and I sent an email out about the dates. Whatever dates are in the uh, the course of pages, accurate. Um, what I said in the classes, not. Right? So if there are no questions, we can continue on with the threads, right? So. In today, I hope to wrap up the topic of threads, and next week we'll look into CPU scheduling. Um, we kind of talked about scheduling a little bit, but we'll look at more details in, in the next few lectures. Um, so when we left off, we were talking about some of the reasons why threads are nice. You know, Multi-threaded programs can give you <coughs> some of the benefits of responsiveness, you know, better sharing, and all those things. But the real one of the real reasons are most of the new machines that you're going to buy are going to be multi-core or many processors, right? And threads are the preferred way for you to access all the resources um, of these different devices. We got kind of sidetracked on talking about the PlayStation um, or some of the newer game game gear, right? <coughs> So we are still talking about it in a high level. So the way I'm going to organize the course, you know, the textbook talks about high level of some of these things, right? And we'll go through one of the a little sample program to get a feel of how the threads look. And I, I encourage you to use those machines to see how a real multi-threaded work program works. Um, the there are two servers. You know, one of them is dual processor and one of them has quad processor. So that will let you see how you can run four different things at the same time on the four processor, right? And so when you're trying to implement threads, right, one of the reasons why you want to do threads is you know being able to assign uh, CPUs and stuff, and threads share all the state from, you know, within the, within the process. I mean, it shares all the variables and all those things. Um, so you can implement that in one of two different ways. One way is to implement that at the user level, right? If you implement it at the user level, you don't need anything from the kernel. You don't need any help from the kernel. So potentially, it could be more portable, right? You, can, you don't have to get the, the operating system does not have to know anything about threads. And you can, you can implement that as a library call. And that's sort of the way that some of the original thread libraries uh, work. So it, it's portable. So one of the, um, the um, Good examples is the PAS6 P threads, which is, a, uh, which, is which means portable threads. Uh, that library implemented that in a completely portable fashion, and the way it did that was you have a user level something which 
makes you look like you have multiple processors. So it will do the context switching, remember the context switching from the process side. It will do the context switching among the different threads. Right? The other alternative is to have the kernel itself know about threads. So the kernel itself knows now about processors and threads. So it knows how many threads are assigned to a given process. And it, it, so it can do the taking the process away and giving a CPU to your process, right? And like anything with the kernel, so if you have to get something from the kernel, if you have to have the kernel involved, right, you have to cross this boundary. You have to go from the user level to the system, to the kernel level. So any request for a new thread would have to cross that boundary and to do a system call. And those tend to be expensive because if you're crossing the domain, so you don't make sure all this stuff happens. And the kernel has to allocate data structures to make sure that it can give you threads. And the kernel can also make decisions on who it should continue, let, let continue, right? So you can look at that as a fairness issue. So the kernel can say, if you ask for a new kernel thread, it can decide to take away the thread from you, which may be fair for the whole system, but may not be fair for what you're trying to do. So those are the, the two implications of the user level or the kernel level threads, right? With the kernel level thread, the kernel knows how many threads you have, so it can potentially do a good job of fairly allocating the resource across all the threads. The negative side is kernel threads tend to be a little bit more expensive than user level threads. Right? There's another problem with the user level thread. So in a user level thread, you're trying to do all the stuff that the kernel can do. You're trying to context switch, you're trying to freeze a thread, you're trying to start a thread, and all those things. Right? But you can only do anything if the kernel lets you run. If the kernel stops your process, then you as application process cannot do anything. So if you write something in a user level threaded uh, library and you blocked, right? If one of the threads blocked, that means the, the, the kernel would put the whole process in the in some queue. You know, it may be blocked on IO, it may be blocked on something. So the whole process is waiting on IO queue. So your thread library cannot do anything, it cannot do its <coughs> magic, right? So you have to be careful with that aspect of the user level thread. You cannot let any thread call, any system call, which will block that process. Because if it does, as a user level thread, you have no control, the whole thing is stuck. The, the, the schedule won't even know what's happening. Right? And that won't happen with the kernel level thread. Right? So you can implement, you know, so you can implement the threads in either in the user level or the kernel level. Having it in the kernel level gives you certain advantages. You know, it, it lets the kernel know what you have. So it can prevent you from one thread blocking the whole process, because it knows about the different threads. It, it blocks one thread, it lets the other things go. Right? It can be a little bit slower because the kernel gets involved, it has to keep track of all this stuff. User level threads are faster, but you have to make sure that things don't, things don't block. So those are two different ways you can implement uh, threads. <coughs> And modern operating systems tend to do both. They, they, they provide you with doing kernel level threads, they provide you with mechanisms to do user level threads, and user level threads basically use kernel threads to do their, their handling, right? To do what they want to do, right? So when you have this mix, you have a number of different ways of how this plays out. The first way is many to one, right? Which is where at the user level, you use a lot of threads, but they all get mapped into a single kernel thread or process. And that's the, that's the way you would implement a, a, a fully user level threads package, right? You, you as a, a library developer, you make it look like you have access to lots of threads, but they all basically, from the kernel perspective, it's, it's a single thread of execution, right? You, you do all the swapping at the user level among the different, um, different threads. On the other hand, you can think of a one-to-one -one where in the program you tend to write threads library using threads, and each of the threads that you call gets mapped directly into a kernel entity, which means that if you have more processors, then you can potentially run that much faster. Right? So in the, in the first case, if you do many to one, right, 
adding more processors does not really help you because adding more processors, you, know, you still get to run as only one process to the kernel, right? Adding more processors may statistically let you get more processors, but nothing, nothing more. Whereas if you have one to one, right, more processors could potentially equal to more, um, you know, you, you're getting more, more CPU resources. And then you have also have many to many, right, where it's, it's, a, it's a hybrid of the first and uh, second, right? So as a user level, you can create more threads, and they all get mapped into a few kernel threads that the kernel <coughs> gives you, right? And the, the last many to many is, is what most of the common libraries do at this point. So in, in, in Linux, if you use P threads, right, um, traditionally, Peters would have done the many to one, but the modern um, Peters library would actually map what you're asking into a few uh, kernel threads, right? And, and it makes decisions on how many it's going to translate to. Usually, you would have the user threads. You can do more than what the kernel level threads get you. So, does that is that clear? So these are different ways of, you know, you want to do the um, trade-off between how soon you can create a thread, how, how much control you want in, in some library, and how fair things are, and what the kernel should do, right? In general, if you have to ask something from the kernel, it tends to be slower than if you can do it yourself, because you don't have to do the protection boundary crossing, which means you have to stay, save the state. You have to call some kernel services to do the switching, if you're trying to do something very small, very short, if you're trying to calculate, you know, i equals one plus one, right? You don't want to cross all these boundaries to get get the service that you want. On the other hand, kernel has a lot more things that it can offer you. You know, kernel can stop you, freeze you, or allocate more resources that the user process really cannot do. Right. And. The other um, variant of this, you know, um, many-to-many -many model is you allow some threads to be <coughs> behaving like a one-to-one -one -one and some threads to be behave like many-to-many. -many. So you have like two levels of stuff. So within your library, within the way you use this stuff, you can say this particular thread, you know, whatever thread you, you, you designate would map directly into a kernel-level thread. and the other threads would share whatever is left, right? So it's, it's still a variant of how you do that. So somebody decides that this is how they're going to map what you asked to what the kernel would see, right? So hopefully this means that if the kernel decides to give you certain amount of resources, right? So suppose these are the only four threads on the system, and it's doing a fair allocation, right? <coughs> we haven't we haven't decided what what this fairness is, and that's the topic of next class, right? Fairness define, depends on what you're trying to optimize. So for, for, for now, let's assume that we're trying to define, d distribute the CPU fairly, right? And assume that we have only one processor, right? So in that sense, fair allocation would be 25% should go to each thread, right? That, that, that would be a fair way of allocating one CPU among four entities, right? And since the kernel only knows about four threads, that's how it allocates. So it'll allocate its CPU in a, in a, in a sort of like a round robin fashion and say, I'll give it, you know, for the first 25% of the time to the, the thread one, thread two, thread three, and thread four, right? So if you go by that model, right, this user thread, which is mapped directly to a kernel thread, would get all its you know, would get 25% of the overall CPU. Whereas those four would share the remaining 75%, right, whatever that number works out to. So they're all one CPU. So this is a way for you to allocate what was allocated to you among different threads. And as you can see, if you, if you add more and more user threads to that, um, the mini model of, of, the comp of the site, right, they will get fewer and fewer amount of resources. Whereas this one, which got allocated the whole thing, it got all the resources, right? 
And we're kind of jumping a little bit ahead because, you know, over the next lectures, we'll, we'll talk about what fairness means and how you do the allocation and stuff. But you know, bear with me on how we, you know, we introduce all these terms. Right. So these are different ways of how you can allocate what you have among different of the libraries. Right. So to make the things more clearer, I would refer to the little threads program that I handed out in last lecture. And <coughs> in case people don't have the uh, handout, I, I think I have a few handouts still left. Um, I have a few, fan, few handouts left, and the program is basically over there, right? It's a boringly simple program. I mean, I wanted it to fit inside one screen of text, so it, it doesn't do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and, but, you know, you, 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 hopefully this will give you the picture, right? So if you look at the, the C program, so it has a function called computation, right? And it does something mind-numbingly simple, right? It, it basically creates a random number, right? And increments that up to 100 and prints it out, right? So hopefully, every time you call this function, you'll randomly start at something, and you'll keep printing 100 times, whatever that is. So if you run this on a single processor, every time you run this program, you'll start with a random number, and you'll go and print that number, yeah, the increments of the number 100 times. And if you have used random numbers before, you will you you may know that if you run this program over and over again, you'll print the same exact random numbers over and over again, right? In your C class, you might have noticed that there's a concept of uh, seeding a random number generator. And since I didn't do any seeding, you'll have the same things printed out, just just to make keep things simple, right? So this is a useless program, but it it it, it points out to something. So. If you look at the order of the main program, right, there are certain calls to the p threads library, right? Without going into the detail, yeah, I, I, I hope that you will look in the man pages to see what they do. So the, the call that you really want to look at is the p thread, p thread create, right? The p thread attribute in it, get some of the attributes from the system and gives it to this call. The real work is being done by the p thread create function, right? So if you look at it from a C perspective, you're basically calling p create with a, with a whole bunch of arguments, right? And if this was a normal C program, you would proceed sequentially. You'll first do the first p create, second p create, third p create, fourth p create. And over at the end, there's a p join, right? I'll, I'll get to what that means in a little bit. So, so you would expect these things to happen in sequence, right? But what really happens is pthread creates would create a new thread. And in that new thread, it makes it run whatever the function you pass. So in, in this case, you pass the computation. So it passes the computation as a function to that new thread. Right? So essentially, you're running computation four times. Right? But since this is a thread library, so each one of them Spawns of each one of them goes off independently and and um, and proceeds to do its task, right? So what you would expect is, if you had if this if the kernel had resources to allocate to each of these threads independently, right? You would notice that there are four threads which are being created. Each thread runs concurrently, right? Each thread runs independently. So the output that you see may or may not be one random number running 100 times, you know, one random number increment 100 times, next one 100 times, next one 100 times, next one 100 times. You would see them all interleaved, right? You would see that one thread runs for a little bit, then it gives up, or the other one also runs at the same time. So your output should show some random number going up to 100, another one going up to 100, another one going up to 100, going up to 100, all interleaved in some random order, right? And 
like I said, this is a completely useless program because it's kind of completely unpredictable what the output should look like, right? And we'll see in the next module how you can make this useful by creating locks and all those things. But for now, this is what you expect. If you run it on a single processor machine, chances are you will see, you know, all of them going one after the other. But if you run it on a multiprocessor machine, on some randomly defined order, you'll see this interleaving happen because they're all happening in parallel, right? That's what you would expect. So I'm, I'm running this on the EXPaces-SVR4, which is a quad processor Itanium, right? So there are four real processors on this machine. So if I run this program, I expect, um, so if I run this program, this particular program uses five threads, right? Can you, can you see why you use five threads? Yeah, so your main thread is also a thread, right? And the P thread join at the end says that the main thread wants to wait for some thread to finish. In this case, it actually waits for the last thread, right? In a real program, you want to wait for one and two and three and four. But again, like I said, this, I want this to be simple. So the, the main thread waits for the last thread to finish. If you don't, then the main thread finishes and then the other threads are running. So then you have to figure out what happens if main thread finishes and the other threads are orphaned, still running, what have you, right? So I'm not going to the detail of the pthreads library. You know, the, there are books on how to use pthreads. So this is a simple program which should show us what really happens, right? So this is a four processor machine. So potentially I can assign four real processors, but I'm using five different threads. Right. So, <clears throat> so that basically compiles your this program to use the Pthread library, and we got lucky the first try, right? So, like I said, those are random numbers, so we have no control over what they are. So the so you can see that you know one thread was running for for a bit at the top, right? And some thread kind of kind of finished itself while the other other one was running, and then you have output from some other different thread, right? And if you run this again, then you see a different order of interleaving, right? And if you can notice that you know there's like this one seven one thread going through, and then there's something like 168, which was just two of them being printed in the, in the middle, right? So like I said, this is a fairly boring program, but if you want to do interesting programs, you would follow something like this. And notice that it's, it's very easy to create these different threads, and it's very easy to create this different threads to use this function. And I didn't use any, any sort of global variables on, in this function, right? But it's very easy to do that. So for example, are people comfortable with the AI? I'm just gonna do the editing, right? So if you have Again, this is a fairly silly useless program, right? So I define a variable called global, and I expect all these threads to share it and then increment it in, a, in some fashion, right? And let me... So what would you expect the output to be? You expect the output to be that they, the output may be interleaved, right? But the global 
should be incremented and go up to 399, right, from, from the different threads. As you will see, it doesn't have to be 399. There are there is there are bugs with this program, but bear with me. Right, we'll we'll see. Um, so you're trying to operate on the same variable without locking and stuff, um, and we'll see why this will fail. But for the most part, this this should do what you expect it to do, right? So for people who use threads before in Java or something, you'll notice that this is horrible style of programming. You're, you're accessing a global variable without locking it. Um, and if you haven't done threads programming, that's some of the things that we'll focus on. I mean, this, this sort of programming, it lets you do operate on multiple, you know, multiple threads operate on the same object, but if you do it without uh, taking care, then you shoot yourself in the foot. So as you could see in this run, right, the first one again is the random number generated increment by one. The second one is the global variable, right? So this 180, yes? Um, where is the 74 there? Is the OS just buffering the output and it's not necessarily the output is on every instant in the thread? Um, yes, and we'll ignore that for a moment too. That, that's a good point, right? So if you if you use standard you know standard IO libraries, right? How many of you noticed what 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 he what he mentioned? Excellent, right? So basically, a standard IO is doing buffered output, right? So if you don't make it thread aware and locked and all those things, you can't really expect the outputs to be flushed immediately. <coughs> so each thread could be buffering it and sending it out at the wrong time. So uh, you notice up up at the top, right? After 368, there is 74 coming from something being interleaved, right? So, you notice that, right? So, yes, it's it's sloppy programming. I, I, I agree. That, you know, I just want to make this simple enough to see show what's happening, right? Luckily for us, we didn't bump into the same problem at the bottom, right? So the second one is the the counters being incremented and. It did what you would like to see. You know, there, are, there are two threads. One of them incremented it for a little bit. Another one incremented it for a little bit. Right. Okay. So I hope you see the the gross picture I want you to see. I hope you also take note that there are a lot more complications in trying to do this kind of a, a shared process. And <coughs> that should lead us into, when we go into more details on how to make sure that we can do sharing among these threads and still do it in a right, right, predictable fashion, right? Um, so the idea basically is all these threads are running. All these threads have CPU. All these threads can do whatever they want to do on this variable. So if you don't protect what they are trying to do, they all step on each other, right? Both of them can take the variable, operate on it, store it, and them stepping on it means that the output does not have to end at 400. And we'll see how. You know, you may get some numbers which is less than 400 for this for the for the counter, right? And that's that's a topic for later, right? But in general, this is a simple threads program. It exposes what it can do and exposes what the problems there are, right? Does that make sense? So, so I I hope that people would go and write a simple program on and run on on, on this machine. You all have access to that machine. And, and see how these things interleave and see how these things work out, right? And we'll spend more time on how to make these things right on the second module. Yeah, so depending on how you look at it, threads programs are really simple or are really hard because now <coughs> you have a lot more ways of shooting yourself in the foot, right? So basically, you have all these four threads running. So debugging them is usually pretty hard because you have all these threads running. So 
you could be following one thread while the other thread comes and changes stuff behind your back, right? So how many of you, so how many of you actually uh, done threads programming on a more elaborate basis than like simple things like this? Simple stuff. Oh, graphical stuff. Same for you too. In a in a course setting or in a job? Honey, okay. Um, so we will spend more time on how how these things work, and in other courses we'll we'll touch upon that. <coughs> So the next set of topics that you focus on are the different issues that threats expose and how you would solve them or, or what, are the, what are the different ways you deal with them. Right. See, one other way is, so what happens when you do fork and exec that we talk in processes, right? So now you have one process which have lots of threads running. So if one of the threads decides to do a fork, right? Remember, fork means that you create a copy of the current process and let it run. So that should mean that you should fork, you should copy the whole process, right? Which means that you will copy all the threads that are running, so you would, you would create, you know, double the number of threads, all of them doing the same thing, right? So that may be something that you want to do, or more realistically, people would you would just you know fork that thread because other way other way you can very easily overwhelm the system because you now you're creating a, a copy of all the threads all of them have to run right. The other option is the exec call. So if you do exec, basically it says that replace my running process with this new application from the file system or, or what have you. So you're trying to run a new program, right? And it, uh, it made sense when you do a fork and exec on a single threaded system or, or a single process, because when you do a fork, you create a clone of yourself. I and mean, when you do exec, you replace the clone with a new running process, right? Whereas over here, if you're having multiple threads, if one of the thread calls exec, it'll replace its process with that new, new the new, new new thing, right? Which means that all the other threads which are running would have to vanish, right? And that may be something that you want to do, may not be something that you want to do, and you know you have to be. So so when you build the library, you have to define how fork and exec would work for the threaded version. If you don't, then any thread can destroy every other thread by doing exec, or any thread can fork creating lots of threads, right? And if all, all the threads keep forking, then you, you create an exponential uh, explosion, right? So there's no right, right or wrong way on these, but the library, thread library, if you look at the P threads or any library that you use, will define what happens when you do a fork or, or exec or any of these things, right? The, other problem we worry about, which is a little different than how it was at the process side, is the termination, right? In the process side, if somebody decides to terminate you because you did, a, you, you did something bad, you, know, you, you, you access some variable that you shouldn't have, you get a segmentation fault or something, and I kill the process. If somebody wants to kill you, do a control C, or what have you. They can kill the whole process, even if the process is in an inconsistent state. Right. If the process is in the middle of doing something, it's in the middle of writing something to discuss something, you killing it, you destroying it, it's bad for the process, it's bad for what it's trying to do, right? But at least that process won't be in an inconsistent state and continue to limp along, right? Which will happen in, in the case of a thread. So if I kill a thread and it's in the middle of doing something, right? And that something may be operating on the global, right? Remember the, the modified program at the end? They're all operating on this global, right? So if halfway through it's, it's doing something with the global and I kill that particular thread, right? So it's gonna leave that global in an undefined fashion. <coughs> in, in this particular case, it, it won't because it's, it's a single variable, it's atomic, and, and we'll see what that means later on. But if it's part of a large C structure, there's a m number of structures, you modified some, you haven't finished the rest of the stuff, somebody kills the thread, right? then you're gonna leave the structure in an undefined fashion. So unless you take care, unless you 
take it, roll all the stuff. It, it messes up the whole thing. So yes, only the thread is killed, but all the other threads now can, can finish what they have to do and you run into problems. So one of the ways you solve that is you don't kill a thread anytime you choose. You only kill them at certain well-defined points. Basically, the thread keeps running, and at some point, it just starts to see, am I scheduled to be killed? If it is, it commits suicide, or it, it kills itself. Right? So you don't kill it. You just say, I want you to die. And it keeps going, <laughs> and when, it, when it's finished, it gets done, right? So yeah, it, when you add the anthropomorphic stuff, it, it sounds horrible. But you know, basically, you don't want to kill it. You just say, when you, when you get a chance, when you are in a good state, terminate yourself. And, and that's, that's a way to solve this problem. So you don't, you don't typically kill on demand. Right. So how many of you use signals in you know, C course? In a course or by yourself? I use it for project. Project. OK. So signals are a mechanism that Unix uses to send interrupts to a process, right? Um, in the intro, I talked about interrupts and, and ways of telling, telling something finished. You know, when I.O. finishes or something, you want to tell the kernel, right? So if you want the kernel to tell something to the application asynchronously, right, meaning anytime it chooses, signal is a good way to do that. And operating system support the notion of signals. Some of the pro, you know, some of the normal signals are kill, right? If I press a Control C on a Unix uh, terminal, that means I want the process to die. So the process will deliver a signal to the to the to the process to, to the kernel will deliver a signal to the process to say what you have to do, right? So it, it can deliver segmentation for <coughs> different signals for those. So basically, the process gets that and does whatever it has to do, right? So there are different kinds of signals. There are signals like die, which the process only has an option to do some cleanup and then, and then go away. And there are other signals which says the timer went away and you can do good stuff with it. So basically, you can, you can figure out how much time something takes by starting a timer, and the kernel will promise that when the timer runs out, you'll get a signal, right? And you know, since many of you have been done signals in, in, in processes, that's, that's, that's the very high level of what, what it does. So basically what happens is the kernel says, something happened, you need to be notified, so here's what happened. Right? In, in a single process, that's, that's pretty clear because the process is the one which is doing stuff. But when you have multiple threads, right? So basically what you want is the signal should go to who, right? So the, the, the signal, some of the signals may have to go to the entire process, and some of them need only go to a particular thread, because all the other threads don't care. And there are different ways of how you solve this stuff, but it, it's a very tricky, tricky thing to operate on, right? There are some signals that you want to have another thread created which will solve that, right? For example, a termination event, right? If I say the process should die, right, the, 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 the thread which can deal with that is the whole process, right? And the, some of the operating systems, some of the systems would, would create a new thread, right, which application would say, if I get this particular signal, call this thread kind of stuff, right? So you may have to create a new thread to deal with this contingency. There are certain signals that may be delivered to the right thread. So if you, if you access a variable that you're not supposed to, then it should actually go to that thread. You shouldn't kill the whole process. You should try to kill that particular thread. If you're setting a timer, that event should go to the right thread. Right? So there are multiple choices. And what you do depends on what signal it is and how you go about doing this. Right? With that knowledge, right? Would that affect whether it's a kernel level thread or a user level thread? I didn't put that in the slide, but basically, do these options, do these things that you worry about come into play whether it's a user level thread or a kernel level thread? Um, 
does it or doesn't it and how do you think it, it affects you? So if you are if you are a user level threat or a kernel level threat, is there a little is there a difference on what I just said? No, it depends. The kernel level is probably going to manage the signals by may generate some kind of error back to the user level thread. Where, the, where if you're accessing the kernel level thread, it's very well, you, you would have more control over the signal process. Mm -hmm. Or at least you know what's going on. Is that, do people hear that? So, you know, if I, if I paraphrase what you said, so if you have the kernel level thread, sometimes you have control, right? Something you have control over what happens and, um, if, you're, if it's a pure user level thread, right, some of the things I, I mentioned can't happen. Like I cannot give the timer event to the appropriate thread unless the library itself knows what each thread is doing. Right? So I can't, so if I'm doing user level thread library and I'm, I'm letting the threads go off on their own, right, then if the kernel tells me that one of, you know, I, in the timer went off, right, user level library has to give it to the right thread. But unless it knows what exactly they're doing, it can't give it to the right one, and you have, you have issues with that. If it's a kernel level thread, then kernel knows that you have threaders, and so it can say thread number 45 needs this signal, right? So if you, if you have one-to-one -one mapping, that works out fine. If you have many-to-many -many mapping, then you still have to do some you know, demultiplexing, so it, it says, Kernel level 40, you know, thread 45 had some issues, and you have to figure out what that meant in user level thread and give it to the appropriate thread. So, depending on how you implement the kernel level user level thread, how you deliver what the user, what the kernel wants to tell you, uh, would fix up. We have issues with that. Then, for performance purposes, you have a notion of thread pool. So, basically. Threads are used a lot in something like web server, right? Web server, a popular web server wants to service different users, so every time a request comes, it wants to use a new thread and then send the output back to them. And if you want it to go really, really fast, you don't even want to create these threads all the time. So the kernel creates a, a certain number of threads, puts them in the pool, and keeps assigning them to whoever wants them. And when you're done, it keeps the same data structure around, right? So that's another way of making this process go even faster. So when a thread finishes, it's not, it's not, you know, it doesn't clean up all the memory, all the stuff, and go back to start. It basically takes away all the resources which are assigned to it and puts it back in the in the pool. So the kernel always knows about the certain number of threads and it keeps assigning them to, them to a different process. So in, that notion is called thread pools. So when it starts up, it says I'm going to create 100 threads. I put them in a pool, so if you ask for four, it just gives them to you really quickly because it's, it's done all the, even the little amount of work it has to do to create a thread. Um, and you could also imagine the, kernel, the, the, the system saying, I will only assign 100 threads, so if you want more, tough luck, right? And that's a way for it to do sort of like long-term scheduling. If, you, if you're asking for too many threads and what I'm designed to give you, I can't give you, right? And it, it all works in systems like the web servers because web servers, popular ones, tend to know how much they want to give and then they want to assign it. Right? It's probably not a good idea for general purpose machines, but operating systems are tuned for different stuff. Right? So when you, especially when you're doing the thread pool, right, you have a notion of thread specific stuff. So the in the vanilla threads I talked about, Everything is shared except for your registers and um, your, your your stack. You also have a you, know, you can also assign a notion of thread specific data, right? So when I assign a thread pool, I can give it some data so I can let it go faster. So these threads are pseudo like part of a process, but I can give it the state that it needs. So if you're talking about a web server, right? It doesn't need a whole lot of state. It, it just needs to know what was asked, what you know, what file has to be delivered and it goes off with that. <coughs> so the, the, one of the other important stuff that the kernel can do to make your implementation of this many-to-many -many and all those things easier is 
if the, oh, if the kernel is completely agnostic or it doesn't know anything about what the user is doing, right? You, some of the stuff you want to do becomes harder. Like, as an application library, I want to know how many threads I get assigned. I, I want to know how many, what is happening with the system, right? So, one of the ways I, the kernel can talk back to the application is through scheduler activation. Basically, it says that this is a way for a reverse system call. The kernel can call into the application and say something, right? The system call basically lets the application start <coughs> into the kernel. Up calls are the schedule activations, let the kernel come back into the application and tell you something, right? But this is a very dangerous operation, so you have to be careful on what you do, right? Because inside the kernel, you are everything. You are all powerful. You can do anything you want. You can access anything you want. <coughs> so when you do an activation, right? So basically, the library says, when this happens, when something happens, I want you to run this code, right? This running this code, if you're running it carelessly as a kernel, you have all the power. So it's basically sort of like running as a super user, so you can do whatever you want. So you have to figure out how to restrict it so that the up calls are not malicious and, and do bad things, right? So the up calls, if, if you're running as kernel, you can do anything. It can, it can destroy processes that are doing some things. So you have to be careful on what you do. But the, 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 some of the reasons you want to do is you, that's the only way for the kernel to say something, right? Usually you call it, you do a system call to see what is happening. So unless you do a system call, kernel cannot tell you anything, right? If the kernel says, I gave you four threads, now I want to take it back. I only want you to give you two, right? It can't tell you that till you go back into the kernel. But if you have up call, the kernel can call into you and say, I gave you four, whatever reason, I'm going to take two of two of those. So do something nice, you know, do something nice to your threads so you won't block. So these are mechanisms where you kind of have a pseudo, you part, part, you push sort of the functionality of the kernel into the application, kind of cooperate. Okay. And the next couple of slides, you know, we, we're going to talk about some of the popular threads package. The first one is the P threads package. We saw a little bit code based on that. The Peters define what the API calls on, what they should do, but it doesn't let you, it doesn't <coughs> define what the mechanisms are, right? So in the Linux, Linux world, P threads can, each threads can map to different ones, right? But you can have P threads libraries where it's many to one, right? So it, it depends on what the implementation is. This is the, the function, the library does not specify what the model is, whether it's one to one, many to one, or many to many. Right. But it defines what the calls are. So any calls written in p threads library should be able to compile on different operating systems. The behavior, <coughs> will, be di behavior will be different, but it's still compile. Right. And Windows XP thread is a one-to-one -one mapping, you know, one uh, from the application to the kernel thread. So it defines all the usual things we talked about and a private storage area, right? And which they call the context. So it, it has the registers and the stack. It also lets you stay, uh, share some of the, um, have a thread-specific data area. And the, the one we looked at just, just a moment back, Linux threads. Um, so the kernel knows of Linux threads. It calls it lightweight processors. And it's a kernel-level thread. And if you call using P threads, you can you can do many to many kind of stuff. Uh, you can also call the kernel threads directly by using a clone system call. And Java has its its own threading model, which gets mapped to different operating systems. So I'm going to, I'm going through these things faster because if you notice the lecture schedule, right? <coughs> After we're done with the with the exams. We have one class where we go through to see how Linux does stuff, right? And, and we'll go through more details on how it happens for a specific operating system, giving us the opportunity to actually look in the code to see how these things are being done, right? Um, so those are the different ways of doing stuff. So next lecture, we'll, we'll start with the ship you schedule it. Um, and if you have any problems with the projects over the weekend, send me an email. Okay, have a good weekend. See you on Monday.